Sometimes you get people coming to meditate saying that they want to learn how to be less controlling. But if you look at how the Buddha taught meditation, a lot of it is about control. It's simply the question of what's possible to control and what's worth controlling, and how to go about doing it in a wise way. For example, when they talk about things depending on causes and conditions, a lot of people think that it means waiting for the causes and conditions outside to be okay and falling in line with that. But when the Buddha outlines causes and conditions, say, in dependent core arising, the primary causes are all in the mind, and the things that you can change. Saying, if you want to control things in a skillful way, this is where you focus. Develop some skill here. This is going to affect your sense of who you are, because your sense of who you are and what belongs to you is very closely connected to control. There's something you can't control at all. You realize, okay, this is not me, this is not mine. The things where you tend to lay claim are things where you have some measure of control. You do have some control over your body, over your feelings, over your perceptions, your thought constructs, and your consciousness. It's not absolute. But you can learn how to control these things in a way that can take you to the end of suffering. And that's quite a lot. There may be some events in the world outside that you can't control, but if you learn how to control your mind, you can do a lot more than could be accomplished by trying to straighten out the world. As the Buddha says, you should experience the world simply as contact of the six senses. And a lot of that is composed of things over which you do have no control. You are experiencing the results of old karma, and you can't go back in time. That's one thing that's impossible. You can't go back in time to change your actions in the past. But the present moment is basically composed of the activity of the mind right now. And you can exert some control here. It's simply a matter of learning how to do it wisely and having a clear sense of how causality works. Otherwise, it's like trying to grow a tree without understanding how trees grow. You want a tree that's a certain shape, and so you get a little seedling, and you start pulling on it to make it that shape. What are you going to do? You're going to end up killing the tree. But if you realize, all you have to do is water the roots. Give it some fertilizer, look after it, make sure the bugs don't get it. And it's going to grow on its own. And you have some control over how it's going to grow. By the amount of water you give, the amount of fertilizer, it may send out some branches in some places you didn't expect. But if you plant a seed for a maple tree, you'll probably get a maple tree. If you plant an acorn, you're going to get an oak. So you focus on the causes, and the results will take care of themselves. So one of the reasons the Buddha taught dependent core arising is to give you an idea of where you do have some control, all those factors prior to sensory contact are things where you can exert some control. You've got fabrication, the very first thing. Bodily fabrication, the breath. Verbal fabrication, directed thought and evaluation. Mental fabrication, perceptions and feelings. You have some control over all those things. You can change the way you breathe, you can change the way you talk to yourself, which is what directed thought and evaluation are all about. You can change your perceptions, even your feelings. 
Remember, there are two main kinds of feelings. There are feelings of the flesh and feelings not of the flesh. And feelings not of the flesh are things that you intentionally create. Either as you think of the painful thought that it is possible to put it into suffering and you're not there yet. There's a little bit of pain in that thought, but there's also some hope, and it's the driving, motivating factor for practice. As for the pleasures not of the flesh, those are the pleasures of getting the mind into concentration. These are all things over which you have some measure of control. So you learn how to do it wisely. You learn some of the theory, and then you learn from your experience. From the Buddhist statement, you learn the Dharma by committing yourself to doing it and then reflecting. And the more you reflect, the more you see. For example, with working with the breath, you want to fabricate the breath in a way that first gives you energy and then calms you down. So how do you do that? How do you work with the breath? And you're going to learn that, after all, there are certain ways of trying to force the breath that don't work. But you learn how to chalk that up to experience. Other ways that involve a minimum amount of force. And the breath responds, and it feels really good just sitting here, breathing in, breathing out. A lot of that, of course, will depend on the perceptions you hold in mind. What's happening as you breathe in? Where does the breath come in? Where does it go out? Where does it start? You find yourself changing your perceptions as you go along. You get more and more focused on the sensation of the breath, not as the air coming in from outside, or even energy coming in from outside. After all, the energy in the body gets full, and then you're more taken with the fact that you can sense the energy originating inside. So you hold that perception in mind. That allows them, the breath to calm down, the mind calms down. Another factor is consciousness. You can choose to be aware of all kinds of things. So what do you want to choose to be aware of? Name and form. How are the elements going in the body? You find that if you think of them, you focus, say, on the solidity of earth or the warmth of fire, the coolness of water, the energy of the breath. You can emphasize one property over another, and that way you can learn how to bring things into balance. As for name, it's basically the five aggregates, or the four aggregates, aside from consciousness, with fabrication divided up into contact contact among various things going on in the mind, attention, intention, these are all things that you can shape right here in the present moment as you're meditating. What are you paying attention to? How are you paying attention? Remember the Buddha said, there's such a thing as appropriate attention and inappropriate attention. Appropriate attention is you start looking at things, again, in terms of the Four Noble Truths. Question of what's skillful and what's not. And these are all attitudes you want to bring to your contact at the senses. So it's a matter of what you're paying attention to, how you're paying attention, and what you want to do with it. What are your intentions? When contact does come, and it is contact with things over which you may not have some control, but you can choose how you're going to focus on things and what you're going to do with what's made available to you. So there's a huge area where you do have the ability or the potential for exerting control. And with experience and practice, you can learn how to do it skillfully. So instead of becoming less controlling, you're becoming more wisely controlling. putting together that raft that will take you across the river, making it out of the branches and twigs and leaves that are on this shore, knowing that the raft may fall apart at some time, but so you want to 
be in a hurry to get across the river. That's another thing over which you have no control, how much time you have to practice. So use that fact to remind yourself, I've got to do as much as I can. So before the raft falls apart, you want to get to the other side. So the Buddha is basically giving you instructions on how to put the raft together and how to make it solid. So you can escape all the dangers on this side. When you have that much control or potential for control in your life, it gives you quite a wide range. As you master these skills, your sense of yourself is going to change. Areas over which you had no control before, you suddenly find that you do have control. Areas over which you wanted to gain control in the past, and you wanted to lay claim to, you begin to realize you can't go there. When you get to the other side, issues of control then get put aside. There's no control over nirvana, and of course there's no need for it. It's not going to go away. It's not going to do anything bad. It's not going to misbehave. It's everything you could possibly want. Better than things you possibly want. So instead of learning to be less controlling, you want to be more wisely controlling and take advantage of this huge opportunity that the Buddha found. He wanted to find if it was possible to find a happiness that didn't age, didn't grow ill, didn't die. He wanted to know if human skills could get, take you there. He found that they could. There is such a thing. That thought right there should act as a challenge. And even though learning wise control takes time, because you're experimenting and learning trial and error, so the possibility of genuine happiness. She gave you enough to feed on, to keep you going. 